Hi, this is MTS Pavat here on Access TV, and uh, with me are Vanessa Bui and Tammy Starley from the Anti-Oppression Network. And today we're going to be talking about the coroner's inquest that just took place uh, recently uh, about Tony Du. He was the young Vietnamese man who was murdered by the Vancouver Police Department. Vanessa, tell, tell us about what, why this inquest took place, the coroner's inquest, and, and what came out of it. Yeah, so um, on November 22nd in 2014, so over three and a half years ago, um, a Chinese Vietnamese man was killed by the police. Um, he was at the East 41st and Knight Street uh, in Vancouver and was in distress. He was waving, seen waving um, a piece of wood and uh, shouting. And so um, someone called the police out of concern. Mm -hmm. And even though they indicated that Tony wasn't threatening anyone, when the police arrived, um, they got out, attempted supposedly to de-escalate the situation, which actually did the opposite. And as a result, Tony was killed within 30 seconds. Um, and so after uh, years, a year of investigation by the Independent Investigations Office, um, there was a recommendation for possible charges for the police officers. The Crown, if, um, in the end, decided not to charge the police officers. And so the BC coroner's inquest um, came as a result of investigating and looking at the details of what happened to prevent future deaths, um, but was specifically clear about not finding fault or finding responsibility, and more so looking at what policy recommendations could be made as a result of this incident. Now you're both there at the inquest. Uh, Tammy, what, what do you think? Was, was there anything good that came out of the inquest? Uh, <clears throat> what struck me was the in-depth uh, analysis by the coroner presiding over the, the inquest, mm -hmm. which was a result of all of the information gathering. I, f I actually f assumed that it would be less uh, in-depth and less challenging. So, th so his recommendations were more powerful than the jury's. Um, recommendations. So he had recommendations, the, he gave them to the jury and the jury could have actually just simply rubber stamped it and said that we agree with everything that he says, the chief coroner of the pre mm -hmm. presiding over the inquest, but they took out some things that were important and uh, presented their evidence and it was logged in as fact. So it was five days, Monday to Friday, I was there for the first couple hours of the first day so I kind of saw what it looked like. And there was a five-person jury, only one person of color. Mm -hmm. So they basically took all of the witnesses that heard and they came up with recommendations. And I know you sent me pictures about you were just waiting for the, the jury to come back. How long did the jury uh, take to deliberate? Um, I'd say a full two hours uh, in total. Um, it did take some time, but I think what happened was they had their own uh, conversations and brainstorm their own ideas mm -hmm. um, during the final hours and what they did was once the the pre presiding coroner and all three council representatives um, offered their own recommendations what they did was just took the language that already pertained to what they had already come up with mm -hmm. um, just because it was more specific to the legal standing so they use the language um, that was relatable to what they had already recommend, had come up with themselves as a jury. So what were the recommendations of the, of the jury? There's a lot, um, particularly pointing to three diff different institutions. So the Vancouver Police Department, specifically um, the city of Vancouver, and then the province of British Columbia, and I also believe the um, health authorities. Um, I don't actually remember the specific recommendations at the top of my head, but the gist of it, um, the two that stand out the most to me was one around information sharing around medical history mm -hmm. of people with mental illness. So asking health authorities to share that information with the Vancouver Police Department so that um, with, the, with the pretense of having it uh, creating an early warning system for the police um, when they're dealing with people with mental illness who are in distress. And then the other piece was around uh, have pl recommending that all p uh, law enforcement authorities in the province um, wear body cameras when they're on duty. Mm -hmm. What do you think of the recommendations, Tammy? I think that it was tragic that uh, the jury actually 
saw fit to water down the recommendations of the actual court, mm -hmm. the, the coroner's inquest. I was, I, I'm still amazed that the coroner made the recommendations that they did, but mm -hmm. it was, but after letting it sit for a few hours after the fact, it actually the, the jury's recommendation and verdict was read at like five minutes to midnight. Mm -hmm. It took a very long time. Everybody was completely exhausted. And uh, I'm just sad that the jury came up with what they came up with and didn't actually d simply recommend what the, what the, uh, the head of the inquest. Now, do you think that the fact that the jury is almost all white except for one is an issue? <coughs> uh, I guess it was an issue with Colton Bushy's uh, what happened there as well. Do you think that's an issue in terms of how the juries are represented? Absolutely. Um, I think for me, it, it's just kind of like, like for me, part of why I feel that the jury shouldn't have done that is because I don't feel that they really had the, they're not experts in this field. Mm -hmm. And so they should have actually went with more with somebody who knows a lot more than they do about this whole process. Right. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, Tony Dew is dead and uh, yeah. a family is devastated. Yeah. Uh, the community is angry uh, and uh, the police really got away with murder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there was no charges yeah. as, as much. I would add too, so um, that while it's important that the jury is representative of the people who are were the topic um, that's related to a lived experience, I think it's also about the, the whole setup of the system itself. So the fact that you know there's no due process for this family to find to hold the police officers accountable for one, because it was really strange to feel like. We're here to look at recommendations, but the main issue is the fact that police officers believe, participate in a culture where it's okay to kill people. Mm -hmm. They're public servants. They're, our tax dollars are going towards. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that shouldn't be a part of their job description is to first harm people, but also kill them. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's no, even with all this whole process going through, at the end of the day, you still feel really helpless because mm -hmm. you, they're just recommendations. They're not even legally binding. So does, did anything good come out of these recommendations or this entire process that is relevant to the broader issue of <coughs> police brutality and indigenous and people of color? The head of the inquest said that he directed the jury to take his recommendations and not just rubber stamp them. So it was a bit of a direction from him mm -hmm. regarding what they came up with, the jury. Mm -hmm. um, however, I feel it's really interesting because these are recommendations. These are like suggestions. Mm. Um, nobody has to do anything. This could be like policy that's just on a shelf and nothing happens. It's just really quite a tragedy. The fact that the Vancouver police continue to stall and wearing body cameras mm -hmm. in their work, they continue to really uh, uh, distance and, and deflect any, any kind of a wrongdoing that they have in the community on a regular basis. As far as I'm concerned, there's a giant culture of, within the Vancouver Police Department about like minimizing their negative impact on the community mm -hmm. regularly. Mm -hmm. it's, I just, it's one after the next after the next, like I didn't know and you know, that's not our job mm -hmm. and on and on. Like how do you ever change something when you deny that there's a and problem? That's such a huge issue, especially here on the downtown east side. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's no charges and this some recommendations coming out of this inquiry and uh, how does the, fa I know there was a vigil after to the actual place where Tony was shot uh, uh, after the inquest on Saturday, the Saturday after. Mm -hmm. But how does the family feel about this whole process? That's just, I guess, that's not been served, does it? No, I, I do feel that they are relieved at, at, in some ways to um, finally understand the details of what occurred because all this time they didn't know. They, mm -hmm. There was no information provided to them until the inquest happened. Okay. So that took three and a half years for them to find the details and, find, and look at the officers in the face, the people who actually killed their brother. Um, but I do know that they feel like, it just feels like nothing's really going to come out of this. Um, and the fact that at the end of the day, it's not just the single officers that are responsible, but that there's a whole culture involved. Because as a result of this process, other mothers and sisters and family members who've been affected by police killings have banded together. So the mother of Hudson Brooks has reached out to Tony's sister, Leanne, and I know the mother of Miles Gray attended the inquest as well. And 
you know, when the police officers were testifying, she was she had to leave the room because it was just so mm-hmm. awful. And so there's, I guess, in some ways, some solidarity building, and that's a positive outcome yeah. of this. So can you talk a little bit about the work of the Anti-Oppression Network and why this work is important in terms of witnessing what happened and what can be done about it? Mm-hmm. Um, the Anti-Oppression Network was founded by myself, God, I don't know, um, eight years ago or more, um, just as a loosely based um, hope and idea about community organizing based on my personal experience as a two-spirited indigenous person of trans experience who has disabilities. I I mean, I just have found that the community is really lacking an intersectional approach to organizing Mm -hmm. in general in terms of naming those things that that exclude and what we can do to include people and, and really build some meaningful solidarity and unity in the community and the, and the issues that we're all facing. Mm-hmm. Not just like, you know, it's only racism exists or only this exists or only class exists. I mean, all of these things exist together. And the, you know, we, we showed up to witness, um, you know, Vanessa had personal, not only uh, contact with the family um, very shortly after it happened, mm-hmm. but also in terms of the, the Vietnamese community and their own family experience as mm-hmm. well. So there was that interrelating in that regard. And, and Vanessa is also with the Anti-Oppression Network and we're hoping to grow the community together in ways that are really important mm-hmm. that I feel that are mm-hmm. really lacking. Well, before we wrap up, I just also want to plug that uh, March 21st International Day Against uh, to End Racism is coming up. And there's going to be a community march starting at uh, Thornton Park at the Main, Tr- Main Street Skytrain Station. And I think it's important to bring up all these issues of mm-hmm. intersectionality around police brutality and racism. So we should have a large gathering there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's going to be a march right through the downtown east side. Um, it's another community march that we're doing to, to build up, raise issues like this. So I want to thank you both for being here and uh, hopefully come back and talk about more of the work that the Anti-Oppression Network is doing. This is MTS Puppet uh, saying thank you for watching Access Community Television.